Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. The holiday season is over, the new year is upon us, and we return to our mission of giving us many more years to come. Here's what happened on the rejuvenation front in December. Starting off with our research roundup, pitching two variants of the Mediterranean diet against each other in a randomized controlled trial, scientists have found that the plant-oriented one, which contained more polyphenols, was more effective for weight loss. Numerous epidemiological studies and a handful of interventional studies have linked the Mediterranean diet to various positive health outcomes, including decreased overall mortality along with a lower incidence of cardiovascular diseases and cancer. Now scientists want to dig deeper and understand which of the many ingredients of the Mediterranean diet make it healthy. In this new paper, the researchers used an interesting study designed to elucidate the role of polyphenols, a class of phytochemicals known for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Polyphenols are abundant in berries, nuts, vegetables, tea, coffee, and many other plant products. For this new randomized controlled trial called Direct Plus, nearly 300 participants were divided into three groups. The control group ate according to healthy dietary guidelines, while the two study groups were put on a generic Mediterranean diet and on a more plant-oriented Mediterranean diet that had the same amount of calories but almost doubled the daily intake of polyphenols as the generic group, 440 mg versus 800 mg. Patients in all groups were also put on an identical physical activity regimen. The participants' mean age was 51 and their mean BMI was 31, indicating obesity. 36% were pre-diabetic and another 11% were diabetic. The main endpoint of the trial was weight loss, but it was measured in a more sophisticated way than just putting people on a scale. Instead, MRI technology was used to quantify abdominal adipose tissues. Following the 18-month trial period, mean weight loss in the control group was negligible, despite patients being physically active. The two study groups, on the other hand, showed substantial weight loss, with the plant-oriented group losing the most weight. Importantly, the plant-oriented diet was shown to be much more effective in reducing the amount of visceral fat, which is considered more harmful than subcutaneous fat. The researchers went to great lengths to establish the effects of particular dietary components. According to their calculations, Higher consumption of green tea, walnuts, and dietary fiber, as well as reduced red meat consumption, were all significantly associated with greater visceral fat loss when adjusted for age and sex. The results of this randomized controlled trial confirm the importance of polyphenol consumption and hint at more plant-based variants of the Mediterranean diet being more effective for weight loss. In a recent study, researchers have shown that growing natural killer cells and reintroducing them back into the human bloodstream reduces senescence markers in a wide variety of immune cells. This research focuses on peripheral blood mononuclear cells, a category that includes T cells, natural killer cells, B cells, and other immune cells that constantly send signals to one another. Normally, natural killer cells keep the senescent cell population under control, a task that goes unaccomplished if they themselves become senescent. While the idea of using natural killer cells to fight senescence has been approached, previous studies in this area were restricted to mouse models and in vitro experiments. For this experiment, the researchers used natural killer cells that had been extracted from donors, propagated and activated, and then returned. With a total of five volunteers, they set out to determine whether or not these activated natural killer cells are a viable approach for affecting senescence in human beings. Three of the volunteers received 1 billion activated natural killer cells and were monitored for 30 days. Two noteworthy senescence markers declined dramatically in all three of these individuals' peripheral blood mononuclear cells after two weeks. One of the younger donors with inflammatory bowel disease had many inflammatory markers substantially downregulated by this treatment. The final two volunteers underwent a much longer-term experiment with 2 billion activated natural killer cells injected at two separate times, once at the beginning and once after 192 days. The effects were similar, 
The senescence markers were substantially decreased at the beginning of the experiment, rose over time, and were reduced once more by the second infusion. No adverse effects were detected in any of these volunteers. While there were only a small handful of participants, this study is an eye-opening proof of concept and suggests that activated natural killer cells can be valuable in at least temporarily ameliorating systemic inflammation and potentially delaying other aspects of aging. A new study suggests that NMN supplementation elevates NAD levels and increases walking distance in healthy participants, with 600 mg a day being the optimal dose. While NAD can be supplemented via precursors such as NMN, this route has a few roadblocks as well. For instance, studies do not always show that NAD precursors increase NAD blood levels. Their safety is a bit of a concern as well, since NAD can provide energy to cancer cells via glycolysis. However, in general, NAD precursors are currently considered safe. This study was based on a randomized, multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial that was co-sponsored by two companies that jointly produce a food-grade NMN product. The primary endpoint was NMN ability to elevate NAD blood levels, with secondary endpoints of safety and tolerability. Physical performance in a walking test, blood biological age, insulin resistance, and overall health via a subjective assessment. Previous studies were often inconsistent in showing NMN health benefits and its ability to affect NAD levels in blood. These studies were often sex-biased or conducted in people with pre-existing health conditions. This time, the researchers made a point of recruiting 80 healthy men and women, 40 to 65 years old, with a wide range of BMI scores. Three different doses of NMN were investigated, 300, 600, and 900 mg a day. NAD levels were increased significantly in all study groups compared to placebo and baseline. There was also a significant difference between 300 and 600 mg a day, but not between 600 and 900. Interestingly, most of the increase in NAD levels happened during the first 30 days of the study, while during the second month, the researchers only saw a very mild additional increase. The six-minute walking distance at baseline was about 300 meters across the groups, which is on the slower side. It significantly improved in the three study groups compared to placebo and baseline. Again, the difference between 300 and 600 milligrams a day was large, but the difference between 600 and 900 was virtually non-existent. The gains in walking distance were substantial, with both 600 and 900 milligrams a day groups adding about 150 meters a 50% increase. The participants were not required to perform any regular physical activity during the experiment. If there was any habituation to the walking test, it should have been noticeable in the placebo group. However, in this group, no increase in walking distance occurred. It is possible that participants on NMN began feeling more invigorated early into the study period and increased their physical activity accordingly, which led to better results measured in the clinic. The participants were also asked to complete a 36-question health and quality-of-life questionnaire. The scores mostly followed the same dynamic as NAD levels and walking distance. There was some increase in the 300 mg a day group compared to placebo and a much more pronounced increase in both the 600 and 900 groups. However, there was no significant difference between those two groups. This study appears to establish 600 mg a day of NMN as a preferred dose that seems to significantly affect NAD levels and physical performance. As in previous NMN trials, no safety problems were reported. However, that does not mean that either efficacy of safety of NMN supplementation have been proven beyond any doubt. Therefore, there should be more studies with larger sample sizes, different endpoints, and longer follow-up periods. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. In December Life Noggin released the final four videos from their collaboration with the Sense Research Foundation. The four damage repair approach programs discussed in these videos were Glycosense, Replenisense, Oncosense, and Emilosense. Here's a taste of the Oncosense video. Welcome to- No time for the intro. Everyone get in here. We've got an important mission. Team, the biggest battle we've ever been a part of is in this body. We're probably protecting someone very high profile. Yes, I put the ointment on, Mom, okay? I'm busy right now. 
Here's the intel. I made everything with construction paper to better express myself and the mission. There are over 100 different cancers affecting organs and tissues throughout the body, and there can be lots of differences between them, like what caused them, what type of cell they formed from, and how severe they are. But they all have one thing in common. It's the thing that allows them to grow and spread indefinitely. And if scientists can find a way to stop it, they could stop cancer. Inside your cells, on the ends of your DNA, are telomeres. These protect the chromosomes by preventing the ends from fraying or tangling. But every time the cell divides, they get shorter. Eventually, they become too short for the cell to divide again, so the cell dies. This is actually a really useful safety feature, especially for precancerous abnormal cells that could one day turn into cancer. But there are ways to lengthen the telomere. The main way is with an enzyme called telomerase. This molecule is mostly found in an important type of cell called a stem cell. Stem cells need to produce new cells throughout life, and telomerase lets them keep their telomeres long enough so they can keep doing it. But sometimes, precancerous cells mutate in a way that allows them to produce telomerase as well. This is how cancer cells are able to keep dividing so rapidly. Uh-oh, uh, we're getting outnumbered. Triangle Bob, stop playing the new Blockymon game and start firing the lasers. In addition to helping the cancer spread, this constant reproduction also makes it hard to kill. Okay, this is getting out of hand. We have to regroup. With each cell division, there are slight alterations made to the genetic code that can help new cells survive a cancer treatment that would have otherwise killed it. This is why cancer therapies today usually work for a while but ultimately fail the patient. But scientists have come up with a new strategy. Here it is, gang. The secret weapon. In order to prevent cancer cells from lengthening their telomeres and not have to worry about some sneaky, mutated cells able to survive treatment, they have come up with a whole body interdiction of lengthening of telomeres, or WILT. With this method, one of the genes that make telomerase would be removed entirely, so no cell could use it. They would also do the same thing for ALT, which is another system cancer cells use to keep their telomeres long. Okay, okay. The cancer cells are dying. This is good. Of course, that means that stem cells would eventually die off too, but they could be replaced every so often, and maybe even with engineered versions that have longer telomeres, but still no working telomerase or ALT. While this strategy may seem extreme, cancer is an extreme disease, claiming over 600,000 lives each year. And as scientists knock down death rates from more and more diseases of aging, cancer will become even more threatening if something revolutionary isn't done. A solution like Wilt could help finally put an end to this devastating disease. If you want to learn more about Wilt, check out our amazing sponsor of this video, Sens Research Foundation. These videos serve as great overviews of and entertaining introductions to lifespan and healthspan extending technology, and they have the potential to introduce more people to this field. You can find all of these videos on the Life Noggin YouTube channel. Please share them with your networks to help us spread the word. New episodes of Lifespan News were also released in December, including one in which host Ryan O'Shea discusses a recent study showing that rapamycin improves the potential of egg cells to form embryos. Here's a bit of that. For those with egg cells, decreased fertility can occur much more rapidly than many other aspects of aging. But now there could be some positive insight into how to improve viability. Researchers publishing in the journal Aging have found that rapamycin, a molecule known for its effects on metabolism and touted as a possible longevity drug, improves the viability of oocytes. These researchers have previously examined the effect of rapamycin on egg cells taken from mice, finding that it reduces reactive oxygen species and protects against DNA damage. This study builds on that work, using oocytes from aged mice and humans over the age of 35. Taking oocytes from 40 to 48 week old mice and cultivating them in vitro, the researchers found that 86% of the rapamycin treated group matured, while only 75% of the control group matured. After a form of simulated fertilization, more eggs from the rapamycin group showed signs of activation, 54% to 41%, and cellular division, 48% to 33%. Similar positive effects were shown on other abnormalities. Roughly 39% of the control group had misaligned chromosomes, while only 20% of the rapamycin group did. Effects on chromosomal spindles and mitochondrial membranes seemed positive, but were not deemed significant. However, the effects on reactive oxygen species and DNA damage were substantial and visible. Fluorescence from reactive oxygen species was 14 in the rapamycin group, 
and 49 in the control group. In the control group, the reactive fluorescence of a particular marker of DNA damage was roughly two and a half times that of the rapamycin group. Finally, the researchers examined a total of 131 oocytes taken from humans who had volunteered for in vitro fertilization. 64 of these oocytes were in the control group, and 67 were in the rapamycin group. While the rapamycin group showed greater maturation, due to the relatively low sample size, these positive results were not deemed significant. However, fertilized oocytes did benefit in a specific and important way. Comparing 39 fertilized eggs from the control group and 34 from the rapamycin group, they found that the rates of normal fertilization were no different, but the number of high-quality embryos was substantially different. The rapamycin group had 12, while the control group had only 5. These are the embryos that are most likely to survive through development and childbirth. The researchers note that these results are positive, but not as positive as they might have liked. Rapamycin was shown to ameliorate many problems with chromosomes and genetic damage. However, it appears to be unable to help cells repair double-stranded DNA breaks, which are more common in oocytes derived from humans over 35, and the researchers believe that this may have affected the results. A combination treatment of NAD boosters, rapamycin, and additional compounds to enhance DNA repair may be the future path forward for improving the success rates of in vitro fertilization, but more research is needed. When there's more to share, we'll have it for you here, so please subscribe so you don't miss out. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. Other episodes of Lifespan News include one on how knowing the statistics about longevity may help you save more for retirement, and another discussing new and innovative ways to support longevity science. Visit the Lifespan News YouTube channel to find these and more. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you.